Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another special edition of the show. I'm at William Fev up here in Chablis. Uh, I've got Nicholas Thompson, uh, who's been kind enough to uh, take some of his time out of today uh, to um, give me a nice little tour of the place. And we talked about the estate, talked about a lot of stuff. And then we're gonna, uh, we're gonna dive into some wine here too. Um, so Nicholas, uh, thank you very much uh, for taking some time with me, and um, let's just go ahead and get started. Uh, okay. We well, talk about where, where we want to start with history or whatever, and we can do that. Well, thank you, thank you for coming. First of all, my pleasure. Uh, so uh, we've just been through the cellar. Yes. Uh, so perhaps uh, for your viewers, uh, give a few details on the on the different pr production uh, steps that we've just seen. Mm -hmm. But just to, to start before that, uh, with, uh, a little well, history. for those who are interested in the history mm -hmm. of the estate, of course, uh, the, the first question we get is, uh, is William, or was William uh, French? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> William, William Fevre uh, it still is French, <laughs> yes, he's still with us. Uh, so Fevre, uh, the, the Fevre name goes back uh, several generations in, uh, in Chablis. Uh, the Fevre family, of which there now are several branches, uh, have been um, winemakers from father to son for several generations. William, who was the last generation of the Fevres to actually one, run the winery, is now retired. Has been retired for a number of years, and the winery now uh, is is currently the property of the Henriot family, of course, of Champagne Henriot fame. Mm -hmm. uh, they took over in 1998, and. Uh, uh, and brought a new uh, lease of life to the to the domain, and uh, with investment, of course, uh, and uh, really it brought the things, uh, the production methods uh, forward, and those are the, the methods that we use to this day. Okay. So. Um, Very nice. Um, so when we when we first started in there, you brought me over to a map of of Chablis, and I know we don't really have a map as a visual to show people, but. Can you kind of talk about the, the four areas of Chablis uh, for us? Yes, well, it's really very simple. If you want to come to Burgundy and uh, pick up on the initial principles of, of how the Burgundian vineyards are sort of organized, mm -hmm. Chablis is the, probably the easiest place to start because uh, uh, the, the geographical elements that constitute the, the organization are really very simple. We have four levels of appellation, which mm -hmm. is typical in Burgundy. Here in Chablis, those appellations are Petit Chablis, Chablis, Chablis Premier Cru, and Chablis Grand Cru. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all very simple. We have one great variety, which is Chardonnay, uh, for all of the wines. Right. There's no exception, so we plant only Chardonnay. Uh, we have two soil types, Portlandian limestone, which is about 120 million years old, and Kimmeridgian, or Kimmeridge clay, as it's sometimes called, which is about 150 million years old. Uh, the Portland, the Portlandian limestone, you'll find that on the hilltops. Uh, that's where we plant the Petit Chablis. Mm -hmm. So the Petit Chablis is not a, a second degree or a leftover of Chablis. It is, in effect, a wine which is planted in a unique area to itself. The other wines, that is the Chablis, the Premier Cru and the Grand Cru, are planted on the slopes. So as you come down from the, on the, uh, the, the plateaus, the hilltops, as you come okay. down to the slopes, right down to the foot of the slopes, that's where you'll find the Kimmer region, which, uh, simply uh, speaking, is a, a, a mix pressed together of uh, clay and limestone, uh, but which contains notably uh, a high uh, quantity of um, fossilized oysters, uh, because 150 million years ago this area was under a shallow sea that deposited these, uh, these, sea lo these um, uh, marine, marine uh, uh, fossils. And it's this Kimmeridgian soil which is really, uh, in a sense, the, 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 uh, the iconic soil of Chablis. So this is the only place in the world where Chardonnay is grown on this type of soil in our mm -hmm. climate. Right. Uh, to distinguish between the three wines that are grown on the Kimmeridge slopes, it's very simple. If you find yourself on a slope 
uh, which is sort of uh, a colder area because it's facing more northerly, northwest, northeastern, uh, away from the sun. Uh, that will generally be a, an area where we grow Chablis. Okay. If you then come over the hilltop, of course, you'll probably cross over some Petit Chablis and you come down on the other side of the slope, which will be then southern, southwest, southeastern facing, just generally more favorably exposed. That will then uh, be a, a Chablis Premier Cru because it will, it will facilitate the, the ripening a bit more. The Grand Cru uh, follows this same principle. That is, it's, uh, it's uh, on a single slope of 100 hectares, which is, uh, I think, about 250 acres. And that particular slope, which is well placed, it's right outside on the edge of the town. In uh, there. <laughs> uh, the town, of course, which is in the middle of a valley. So there's a river uh, running through Chablis itself and running right through the, the vineyard, cutting the vineyard in two. We could talk about the left bank to the, to the west and the right bank to the east. Uh, and the Grand Cru are on the right bank to, you know, to the east of the, of the town. Uh, very well exposed, like the Premier Cru. The, the particularity of that, of that uh, specific area where the Grand Crus are planted is that we have the highest concentration of the Kimmeridge soil, okay. so which will give an even more intense uh, uh, experience of the, the particular aromas and textures that you, that you get uh, classically in a Chablis. All right, very nice. Um, and as I mentioned, I, before I came here, before I had lunch, I had some time. I came up here specifically so I could walk through the Grand Cru vineyards or most of or some of them. And uh, they're really high. Well, I mean, for a guy who's overweight and out of, out of shape, um, <laughs> it was definitely a nice little hike up, up, the, uh, up the hills and um, really spectacular. And of course, when I got not to the top top, but when I got as high as I did, the view was spectacular to, to go back. So um, it kind of helps to really see that and get an idea of what what the uh, aspect and the, the um, uh, not the aspect, the um, orientation, but there's another word used. The topography. Used, and and, and uh, um, aspect, whatever. Anyway, how, it, how everything's oriented. Um, yes, the inclination. In, inclination, yes. yeah. All that, all that kind of stuff is really helpful to, to see all that. Um, so then we finished that, and then you were talking about um, uh, the grapes. So you said that there actually are a lot of, um, a lot of Chablis is mechanically harvested, but everything for here is not, right? That's correct. Uh, harvesting in Chablis nowadays is done largely uh, by machine. Mm -hmm. uh, we are one of the last producers to, to harvest our entire property uh, by hand. So we have uh, uh, 78 hectares, which I think, uh, don't quote me, is about 200 acres, just under 200 acres, right. uh, which consists of uh, Chablis, Chablis Premier Cru and Chablis Grand Cru. Uh, and we still hand harvest our, our vines. Uh, we do produce a Petit Chablis, uh, but since we don't own any vines uh, it classed in Petit Chablis areas, we buy the crop from okay. another producer All right. uh, for that particular wine. And you're showing me the uh, the bins. Like, tell me about those bins. That's right. So, uh, of course, there you can hand harvest, but the way you then uh, treat and transport your the harvest, uh, there are different uh, possibilities. For us, the it's uh, of utmost importance to to work as delicately and, and rigorously as possible. And so we use uh, small cases, which are only about. Uh, what two feet wide? Yeah. Two feet long. Sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, just a few inches deep, uh, and so each uh, each case will contain no more than maybe twenty five pounds, okay. like thirty pounds at the, at the most of grape bunches. Uh, they're, they're, so they're filled just below the edge, uh, and these cases are then stacked one on it on, on top of the other mm -hmm. uh, in a way that prevents the, the 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 actual grapes and the bunches from being uh, crushed. So the, the grape bunches arrive in our cellar in effect in the best possible state without having, without any of the quality of being uh, compromised at that stage. Okay. And then you said that uh, you guys were one of the first people to really use a sorting table? That's right. Yeah. So uh, in 1998, when the Henriot family uh, took over the estate, uh, we shifted a gear and, uh, and brought in some very uh, uh, intricate methods. So the, the whole, the whole uh, idea, the whole, all the principles that we follow from A to Z with the hand harvesting in the small cases, that leads then up to the hand sorting on the, on the sorting tables, which was until then unheard of in Chablis, uh, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, and so to this day, we still hand, hand sort 
uh, the great bunches on those sorting tables as a last step of quality control allows us to pick out leaves just to really have the best possible c uh, control over what will go into the press. Okay. And then uh, where, where do the grapes go from there? Well, uh, as you saw early on, uh, the, 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 um, the arrival key uh, of our cellar is at the ground floor where mm -hmm. the sorting tables are. Uh, and the press then is uh, below, uh, uh, sort of wedged in between the, the ground floor and the underground cellar floor. That's so kind the, of unique. I've never seen that before. <laughs> well, it's, it's, a, it's a contemporary idea now, yeah. uh, the, the top-down uh, procedure where everything, we, in, in order to allow every procedure to, to sort of occur naturally without mm -hmm. having to intervene excessively as winemakers, the, the grape bunches will fall into the, uh, the press. Right. Uh, <clears throat> and when we press, because we've hand-picked, hand-sorted uh, on sorting tables, We've, we've maintained the grape bunches in the best possible condition. We can press on the stems with very little pressure. We can burst the grapes and the stems will facilitate the release of the juice. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll allow the juice to, to flow more, more freely. And because the press is actually sus a, it, uh, suspended above the cellar floor, right. uh, the juice will, will flow naturally by gravity. Uh, and this way we can obtain a juice, the juice that already corresponds uh, to, the, to the qualities that we're looking for in our wine. If you think of Chablis as being a light, crisp, fresh and delicate wine, we want the juice to already have those inherent qualities, obviously. And that's right. how we obtain that. And uh, so you, you get them into the tanks and then how long do they stay in the tanks before you move on? Well, we'll start in uh, with a... Um, with uh, uh, well, basically decanting tanks, for want of a better word, or, okay. or débourbage, if you want the French term. <laughs> uh, but it, it is effectively settling. The juice will settle for 24 hours in these tanks. Uh, we will cool the, those tanks in order to uh, prevent fermentation from starting, also to preserve the juice in, uh, in a very fresh state. Uh, and it's just to allow the juice to fine out even more. Okay. So we will then rack the juice uh, into another tank to start fermentation and separate the sediment uh, from the bottom of the tank that, you know, the sediment that accumulated over those 24 hours. Okay, and we actually didn't talk about it, um, but th there, do you do any any additional filtration or fining? Not, kind not, of get a little bit of, not, in, 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 not at that stage. Okay, but, okay. Yeah. Um, and then they'll go from those tanks into um, fermentation, fermentation tanks. tanks, right? Yes. Um, and then talk, talk to me about your oak your oak regimen and because uh, you do use oak but not uh, but it's not like the same thing forever you you better for you explain it <laughs> well uh, as as we've seen in the cellar uh, we have uh, we're we're well equipped with uh, with tanks and yes. notably stainless steel tanks which are of course the most conducive to uh, to making a wine where you preserve all the inherent qualities all the primary qualities of the wine uh, to keep the clarity, the, the focus, um, the freshness. Mm -hmm. uh, nonetheless, uh, a, a tank is hermetic and is closed and uh, Chablis has a tendency to, to uh, reductivity. So reductivity in wine, in wine tasting uh, terms really is something that will that will suppress the aromas not, uh, notably, uh, that, that contributes to the character of Chablis, which is often reserved, strict, uh, understated, which can be a quality, uh, but it's also something that can inhibit uh, the, the actual expression of the wine. And so the barrel still has an advantage, and that advantage is that it's a porous material uh, that will allow uh, oxygen to be involved in the production uh, mm -hmm. procedure. Uh, so we do uh, we do use uh, French oak barrels to a degree uh, to ferment a part of each wine. Uh, none of the Petit Chablis. The Petit Chablis is the only wine we produce in tanks uh, exclusively. All of the other wines are partially barrel fermented. That means literally a part, anywhere between 10% up to 70% of the wine uh, will be taken out of the tanks and put into uh, French oak barrels to complete the alcoholic fermentation and the malolactic transformation. Uh, and we find that they, they will be able to breathe in a sense, mm -hmm. and uh, that allows them this, that, that uh, micro-oxygenation allows the, the, the natural characters of the wines to de develop a bit more easily. Okay. But we're very wary as to not, uh, not to um, 
suppress the natural qualities. Chablis being, a, of course, a very a more delicate wine than many other wines made from Chardonnay. Uh, uh, there's a risk uh, that, that a, uh, excessive use of, of an oak barrel uh, for fermentation and for, especially for aging uh, would, um, would obscure the finer qualities that we're looking for in the Chablis. And so this is why only a part of each wine is barrel fermented. The barrels we use are, are effectively old barrels, as mm -hmm. we would say, old barrels is effectively a barrel which is already older than four years. So right. most of our barrels are between four and six years old. And the wines that are, the part that is barrel fermented, will only stay in those barrels for approximately five months before finishing and maturing in stainless steel tanks. So okay. the actual maturing, which is the longer period, about 10 months, uh, will uh, will occur in stainless steel tanks before bottling. Okay, yeah. So since since the, uh, the oak barrels are the age they are, um, they they don't have as much. They basically have zero impact um, on the wine as far as flavor components. Is that what we're saying? What we we, yes, I mean, we, we call them neutral oak. So yes, where we seek to minimize the uh, the, the sort of the 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 orthodox. Uh, 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 effect that, uh, that other winemakers might be looking for from a barrel. We don't, right. we don't want those characteristics from the barrel. We it's want really for the oxygenation. For the, exactly, okay. yes. Um, so after about 10, about 15 months or so, then you go to bottle, right? Uh, for the Premier Crew and the Grand Crew, the, okay. uh, the wines are effectively released into the market uh, only the second year following the harvest. So okay. this year, we're two, it's 2017. So all the Premier Crew and the Grand Crew from this year will be available. Uh, as of beginning 2019. Okay. Only the Petit Chablis and the Chablis are, are bottled and released a bit earlier. Right. And perfect timing, I don't know if you can see it back there, the smudge pots. So this is from this year, right? This was in April 2017. That's right. Okay. So kind of tell me about what, because maybe not all my viewers understand what happened uh, during April to the area. Uh, well, it's, it's unfortunate, but uh, uh, again, uh, weather conditions were unfavorable in, in April. Uh, basically, what happens is there's a following, well, so towards the end of winter, beginning of spring, what can occur often is that we have a, a short sustained period of, uh, of uh, warmer days, especially warmer afternoons, which will bring, which will start the, the, the green cycle of the plants. So the plants will start to come back to life. The sap will start to rise. The buds will start to open up. Mm -hmm. uh, but then at, the, at, uh, at night, the temperatures will drop uh, to below freezing. And those buds, which of course would eventually, uh, you know, blossom, become and, and be your your um, your grape bunches. <laughs> right. Those buds uh, will then freeze. Mm -hmm. uh, so Chablis is, of course, uh, uh, really at the north, really much northern part of uh, of the wi of wine making areas in France, and has uh, historically always been uh, vulnerable to spring frost. Okay. So uh, yeah, you tell me that the manufacturer that that made that makes these smudge pots basically was out of stock by this time. Uh, there was there was great demand because <laughs> yeah. of course in two thousand last year in two thousand sixteen frost was extremely widespread not just in Chablis but all all over Burgundy right. uh, and many other vineyards in France in fact uh, so much so that this year people were extremely uh, um, uh, uh, worried and right. and there was a there was high demand for these smudge pots so these smudge pots which are lit, set up at intervals in the vineyards, lit as to try and maintain a minimum temperature, ambient temperature around the vines. Right. And here we have the other technique, which is uh, very commonplace <coughs> in Chablis, the uh, spraying. So we actually create an, an ice casing around the vines, which will actually, and within that ice casing, the buds will not freeze. Right. So it's, just, it's almost like a, a weird form of insulation. I've, it is, yes. It's, it's, <laughs> I've it's, always been amazed by that. It's counterintuitive, but uh, right. uh, it's important that we keep spraying uh, right through into the next morning until the ice then melts away. Okay. So if we were to stop spraying, then then the, the buds would come. So we've, uh, there's a large quantity of water that's sprayed. Wow. Um, and uh, I'll try to remember to put a link to this video uh, on YouTube. You told me it was on it was an English version. Of I this. think there might be one yeah. on YouTube. Yes. Okay. So I'll I'll definitely look for that. Um, or anything else with this uh, this year's vintage um, beyond beyond that? Anything unusual, or is it just a really nice vintage? Uh, 2017. Uh, it's it's looking uh, well, apart from the, the the loss of yields again. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, the quality is otherwise looking uh, very good. Uh, and of course, the the work has been done. 
uh, we have a we have a high ratio of uh, workers per surface area, mm -hmm. more than is common in Chablis. Uh, that is, uh, generally you attribute to to, a, to, uh, to your vineyard workers a certain surface area. Okay. The less, the smaller the area is, the more attentive they can be uh, okay. to the work that they need to do. Uh, and of course, with the hand harvesting and the hand sorting, uh, that will always allow us uh, to achieve uh, uh, desirable, you know, the desired results. Very nice. Well, I think uh, maybe it's time to kind of taste the results. <laughs> um, so what, what do you have uh, picked for me? Well, we're going to start off with two Chablis. Okay. Uh, well, the same one, which is uh, a Chablis Chant Royaux, which is actually a, a wine which is largely sold to, uh, uh, to export markets, okay. notably in the United States and, other North, and North America. Okay. Uh, so I have the Chant Royaux 2015 and the 2016. Okay, very nice. Yeah, that's the 15, that's the 16. All right. So there you go. I'll take a look over the. Very nice, very nice. Yeah, so let's, so this is the, we're doing the 16 first? Yes. All right. It is of course a recent bottling, which does, you know, should be taken into account. Mm-hmm. Well, it doesn't smell like the barrels. We, so when we were down there, they were doing topping off and, and we were talking about the smell. And I mean, it was like, you said, it's not, it's, they're dry, but it smells sweet. And I'm like, yeah, it smells like margarita mix. And not in a, I mean, it really had that lime, that, that, that lime uh, flavor or yeah, aroma. That's right, yes. The fermentation was completely uh, yeah. finished. So Chablis is a, is, is a dry wine. Mm -hmm. uh, there is little to, well, in, in, any trace amounts of residual sugar are negligible. Right. So even if you have a Chablis from a warm year with good ripeness and you have the impression that they're fruity and rich, uh, they are still, strictly speaking, bone dry. We, we didn't really talk about it in the tour, um, but I imagine basically it's just whatever natural yeast is in, is in the air because you, you're wiping off the, the map. The board. <laughs> well, we use for the fermentation natural yeast, uh, notably for the Premier Cru and the Grand Cru, okay. uh, where we really seek to preserve the identity of the, you know, the specific plots because mm -hmm. those will be wines made from specific, uh, very uh, limited locations. Uh, for the Petit Chablis and the Chablis, however, which are blends of uh, various pot plots, we use uh, neutral yeast okay. uh, in order to, to achieve better consistency and to allow fermentation to start quickly. Right. Again, we want we seek to preserve the freshness in those wines. Uh, it's very important, so to to to, to have you know good control over over the start of uh, okay. the fermentation. So, um, you know. It it's very light. Um, I mean, there's a little bit of lime there, you know, I, also my nose is not the best right now, but you know, it's, it's, I would call this mineral, which is a really bad terminology because we all, all these Psalms love to throw out the word minerality and minerals have zero smell, but, um, you know, there's like that, there's a bit of chalkiness to it and a bit of lime to it. Just very, very light. Then on the palate is very crisp, um, continuing with that lime and that lime zest and, you know, great acidity, which is definitely a trademark of, of Chablis. Um, very important. One of the things I truly enjoy about this is, which I didn't tell you, this is, this is my favorite way to drink Chardonnay. Chardonnay and I are not the best of friends, but when it comes to Chablis, I love Chardonnay. I just love the style. So this was a thank, great, thank, yeah. Thank the soil. <laughs> <laughs> this was, uh, you know, definitely being able to come up here and and and, uh, and check it out. This, this is my favorite. No, nothing against the Chablis. I mean, the um, the Chardonnay's I had in Burgundy, which have been great. I've been really loving what they have down there too. Um, but this is my ultimate, you know, uh, in, in the glass for Chardonnay. So, and this is this is wonderful. I mean, yeah, it's very very acidic. Uh, again, the lime. Uh, the chalkiness. In case you haven't figured out, I don't just spit at, um, at home, I spit here too. It's actually kind of expected. <laughs> but yeah, this is beautiful. Let's see how the 15 comes out. So I don't think I ever counted the story 
on camera this past week, uh, but I've told a couple of people about it. Um, I, my, when I first got in, uh, landed in Leon, I'm driving up to Bone, and I decided to listen to one of my fellow podcasters, Levy Dalton, and he was, I was listening to one of his interviews, and it was with um, Becky Wasserman, and she talked, she related a story about the first time that she, when she first moved to the area and she went to her first actual like domain to do tasting, she didn't spit. And so she got pretty drunk. <laughs> I don't think she did that again. Maybe not intentionally. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, it's very much, I mean, the thing is like in the United States, I've seen it so many times, whether it's where I live or California, um, People go to wineries and they do tasting, but they never spit. And um, you, you, you got it. <laughs> go drink it, you know, swallow it later. This definitely has a little more um, aromatics to it. It's definitely opened up a little bit more. Um, I mean, it's got the same lime, but I would also add uh, some lemon to it. Some other citrus, touch of orange to it. There seems to be a little more full body to it, even though it's still going to be um, very light. Yeah. Almost reminds me of, uh, so when I had lunch today at that uh, restaurant, they gave me some little candies. And it was like an orange candy and a lemon candy that they gave me. And very similar uh, to that. And the extra year, I mean, I know we're talking different vintages, vintages, but this, but this 15 really has a lot more going on. Um, it's more in the mouthfeel, um, or you know, more in the palate. Um, the the uh, on the nose, everything on the nose is on the palate, just expanded. Um, again, great acidity. Um, yeah, I mean, this is this is really good. Like, I like the 16, but I like that. A lot. <laughs> 15 has the advantage, of course, of having been in the bottle for you know for a year extra, right. where it's probably regained a bit more of its balance between, as you said, the nose and the mouth. Right. Uh, but 15 was, <laughs> is generally speaking, a very flattering vintage because it was it was really very warm. Mm -hmm. uh, both June, June and July were dry, hot months, and so we had the uh, the harvest, which you know started to concentrate. Right. And so the wines really, like again, as I say, these are dry wines but they will reflect their vintage and so we have that concentration from from the 2015 weather uh, right. which makes it for a very a more a denser fuller richer vintage uh, and a bit more enveloping on the palate uh, quite flattering for, really it's one in the recent years it's one of the most flattering vintages right and yet again you will find on the finish uh, that uh, trademark uh, acidity to Absolutely. give it the balance so even after two, three, four glasses, it will never become saturating. You yeah. will always have that balance, the contrast, which will, which will, uh, which will uh, always end on a on a on a fresh note. Right, and then um, we 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 didn't really talk too much about sixteen. Um, talk about how much our challenge sixteen was. Well, 16 was a challenge simply because of the, well, the challenge came early in the year because we right. had spring frost again in, uh, throughout April and it was excessive. Uh, and so we, in effect, lost uh, the largest part of what would have been our harvest. So 16 was worse than this year? By far, By, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. In, in, certainly uh, in, in the last... 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. uh, by far the, 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 the most, uh, uh, the, the vintage with the, with the greatest loss by far, right. yes. And we, we touched upon it right before we started recording about, about the weather. Um, and it, there's, there's more of a trend of it being able to just getting to be a, a, a better or a climate more conducive to Chardonnay or like a, little, or like a warmer climate well yes in general yes we we are sort of uh, we, we see that now sort of the the favorable growing zone um, sort of shifting to our our advantage of course Mediterranean growers might be struggling more because mm -hmm. now they're having to uh, face uh, more excessive heat and that's why drip irrigation is now uh, partially allowed in some parts in the south for us that means that Sh that Chablis 
which is on the northern tip of, of uh, French winemaking areas, has now sort of shifted into the more fable, grow, fable, favorable growing area. Right. Uh, the, the, there are still challenges because although we have a very continental climate, uh, which means we can have nice, uh, sustained, warm and dry uh, summers for the growing season, which is of course great and required, um, we still have the, the, uh, the threat of, um, of also very cold temperatures at the beginning of the season and towards the end of the season, mm -hmm. but notably at the beginning of the season. And we also have an oceanic uh, and Atlantic uh, influence which can bring in, as we see today, uh, some humid weather uh, yeah. and of course that humidity coupled with possible drops in temperature can uh, can cause problems and difficulties uh, right. notably the spring frost yeah exactly well um, I, I just want to thank you so much uh, for this uh, visit and um, you know I, I this is you know burgundy is a bucket list type of thing but Chablis was really like I, I've was a big kind of a bigger bucket list i kind of wish i had been able to spend more than just like a day up here but um you know i had to figure out what i was going to do <laughs> between burgundy proper chablis and beaujolais because um, i only got one day in beaujolais too uh, which is another favorite of of mine but um you know i definitely want to thank you for uh your time you're very um, welcome and uh, being able to see me is there anything else you want to talk about if you have a few more minutes absolutely have, all the time in the world uh, honestly <laughs> i have a few more bottles in the fridge if so yeah. if you want to put on some interview into uh, you know the commercials <laughs> or interval music i don't know uh, well yeah let me uh, disconnect you and then you can go okay. and you can go there you go I'll just finish yeah then you can on. leave that on okay and then uh i'll I'll fill time. <laughs> um, so, folks, uh, I know I'm not have the best light here, but um, you know, me, let me tell you, uh, driving up here from Bone was really cool. So, besides the fact that visiting an area really gives you um, a great idea of what the area is like, I mean, looking at a map and looking at pictures is one thing, but driving through an area is incredible. Um, there literally are no vineyards between bone and chablis um i mean it's not until you get about seriously like two or three kilometers from uh the center of town that i start seeing um some of the regular chablis uh, vineyards and then another like half kilometer or whatever finally the, the the hills to my left were uh had changed and i could see some uh some of the other uh vineyards on the left side and between here and there is cows. So, and I saw the town where the Epoisse cheese is made. Well, I didn't look, I mean, I saw where it was. So I'm imagining that's where a lot of the cows are. But yes, yeah, a, lot of, a, lot of, uh, a lot of, I don't call it livestock because I'm assuming these are, these are cows that are more for uh, making cheese and milk rather than, than uh, being eaten. But then there's also a lot of um, uh, farmland too. So. Uh, all kinds of cool stuff. So definitely it's not just vineyards all over the place. Uh, here we go. Get you plugged back in. And back uh, online. We're back online. <laughs> all right. Okay. See, I totally can fill time. <laughs> As my viewers know. I bet you're used to it. Uh, yeah. So we'll continue since we've, uh, we have the, um, the Chablis, uh, the Chant Royal 2015. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, as you can probably understand, due to the... Um, uh, the weather conditions in the last few years, uh, the, the little wine that we do have uh, uh, is in, in, in short supply. So we'll be skipping the 2015 Premier Cru, which are also allowed here in France, perhaps not in the States <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, and elsewhere in the world. Uh, so we'll be continuing with the 2015 Grand Cru. Okay. This is the Vaudizier. All right. I was checking that place out. You were, yes, you told me. Yeah, was that was the, the one you referred to as the amphitheater. The amphitheater, which is yes. A great description. So um, where I was at, that little building, there's a, there, there's a non Grand Cru name for, there's like a little plot up there. Uh, I, it's, um, man, I can't remember the name. Yeah, well, that's the competition. Yeah, oh, it's competition. <laughs> anyway, in general, in, in the wine world, it's, it's the eighth Grand Cru that's really not a Grand Cru. Yes, the, the reason behind that is that before the appellation system was established and formalized in the 1930s, mm -hmm. uh, there was uh, one of the, uh, one of the um, 
oldest uh, estates in Chablis uh, that had a plot uh, in the Grand Cru area that was referred to under a under a brand name. Ah. It had its it, 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 the, under that party plot. Uh, and when the when the appellations were created and the uh, the so-called climates that is mm -hmm. the the growing areas, the specific growing areas were defined, he found his plot uh, straddled across two of these different areas. So in theory, that he would have not been allowed to call his wine uh, either of those two uh, climates. He wouldn't have been able to call it Vaudésir or Preuse, which is the other one, so, right. which would have been a disadvantage. And so he was allowed to continue using the brand name to refer to his plot. But it is that that particular wine is effectively a, a blend of mostly Vaudésir and a little bit of Grand Cru Preuse, which is next to the Vaudésir. Okay. That's Very nice. Well, thank you for the information on that. I won't say who it is, though. <laughs> <laughs> you guys will look it up if you want. I'll put the name, though, of because I can't remember. What was the name of it? Long de Paquis, La Mouton. Yes, because it, it was like Mouton. No, no, that's a different. It's a totally spelled differently. It's M O N T O N N E. Uh, Mouton is M O U M O U T O double N E. Yes, double N. Yeah, yeah. I forgot the U. Anyway, I was like, but it sounds like Mouton in Bordeaux. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it's like I knew it was like what well, sounds like something else, but what was it anyway? Um, but let's get back to this. So um, this is the 2015 uh, Grand Cru Vaudésir. Vaudésir. Man, I would I would have totally butchered that name. I would have said. Vodister. Well, I wouldn't have been that bad. I'm getting I'm getting better with my French pronunciations, but as you can see, we've cheated a bit. So strictly speaking, we for a tasting, you, we would open the uh, the bottles, uh, uh, you know, freshly opened bottles. These bottles were opened uh, late this morning, so mm -hmm. uh, what two three hours ago, three hours ago. Uh, and it's probably beneficial because Chablis, being very very a very crisp tart wine. Uh, you know, very focused and with good clarity, right. uh, and, and very, very tense. Uh, is a wine which merits uh, um, often being decanted. I would even suggest, uh, at, at the very least, it merits um, having some oxygen being aer aerated. Right. For the same reason that we barrel ferment the wine partially to allow the wines to oxygenate, to breathe, to open right. up, to become a bit more uh, expressive. Uh, So very similar to the to the last one I had where you got the lemon and the lime and the orange. The very first time I tasted it, and it might have been just crazy because I didn't really catch it the second time, I could swear I got some caramel out of this, which was unusual, but it also could have been I remembered the candies because they also gave me a caramel at the restaurant. So I might have in my head going orange, lemon, caramel, but there was definitely um, a richness to it to me. Um, but you still have, again, acidity is going to be the broken record in Chablis. You're just going to say great acidity, high acidity, because it's just it's natural. That's what it is. And that's, what, that's what's so great about it. Um, and that's also one of the things that helps keep it preserved um, while you can age a lot of these wines. Um, imagine these can age fairly a long time, right? It's a question of taste. Um, yeah. it, it, truth be told, uh, a lot of Chablis is probably drunk young because it is often very flattering when it's young, such mm -hmm. as the Vaudésir. That's a good example of a wine which is already very forthcoming, right. despite its being quite young. Uh, Vaudésir is a, is a favorite for that. Uh, but you're right, these are wines which could age uh, easily 10 years uh, without losing much of their youthful um, liveliness. And this is, that's the beauty of Chablis, uh, is that it can, it can gain in richness and complexity mm -hmm. uh, and uh, openness with time. But at the same time, because of that acidity that, that sort of stays in the background afterwards, it's still there and it will still make the wine seem uh, very lively. Mm -hmm. uh, so it actually takes a very, very long time for a Chablis to actually drop off uh, so 10 years is, is uh, especially for a vintage like 15, which right. has a lot of substance because, you know, because of the hot vintage, as well as very high acidity. Right. Uh, 10 years is no problem. Uh, some people would, would rec who like older, even older wines would recommend to age these maybe even 15 years or even more. Okay. Um, one of the other things that uh, I also get on this, I get, there's a bit of a floral component then, and I'm not really great with florals, but I do get a little orange blossom too. So um, this is excellent. And you described it well, saying it's an amphitheater because Vaudésir mm -hmm. is in fact very steep, sort of uh, arched, facing the south, 
And so the, the sunfall really does give it a, even in a cooler vintage, uh, it, it will always uh, develop a, a more forthcoming, sort of richer character, mm -hmm. which makes it so generous and, pl and flattering when it's young. Um, just as we're, you're describing it, I've I never really thought about it this way, um, and, and maybe it's very minimal, but because of how it's has oriented, basically just think of this bowl cut in half, um, it's almost like also a satellite dish. So I, I don't know if this really does anything to the middle part of it, if, it, if, if, if the sun reflections from the, from the, from the leaves do any extra concentration but it'll it will as you've probably seen the the vines are pruned low yeah so it's not to cast too much shadow over each other right because they're planted densely uh, and this is why the inclination is important and the more you have a greater inclination the greater the sunfall will be and of course you've seen that the soils are very rocky very pebbly uh, and depending on the exact composition so especially if you have a lot of if it's very rocky and pebbly and with a lot of limestone mixed in those will be soils which will uh, absorb and reflect the heat more and you were saying it's a it's a struggle sometimes it, going up some yeah. of those slopes in the summer if it's hot in the town you can bet if you go if you're walking up the slopes you will really feel the heat yeah uh, you'll be like between the sun and the uh, the sun coming <laughs> the sunlight coming down and the heat being reflected off right. the ground uh, man <laughs> and so that's uh, that's that's basically vote is here in a nutshell okay it was pretty amazing but yeah the wine is pretty amazing too so we'll continue with another 2015 Grand Cru. This is the Bougro. And that's on the, that's at the very end. And that was an area I didn't get to, right? That's right, exactly, yeah. yes. Taking into account that the Grand Cru growing area covers a slope of about 100 hectares, which I think is about 250 acres. So it's a relatively limited area. Mm -hmm. So your you, different growing areas are never far from the others. Right, yeah, that was pretty much well, I, I got to it. I didn't actually walk through it. I, I stopped there to take pictures and literally it's like right, I mean, this is a hill that's just going right to the right to the road. And I mean, it's just steep, it's, it's just very steep. Um, and then I was like, I'm gonna go back up that other road because I'm not gonna, even though it said, don't come up here unless you're doing agriculture or something like that. At least that's what I think the French sign said. I said, well, I'm gonna drive up there anyway. I, I stopped pretty close and I didn't go too far, but um, especially the car, you can't really drive too much on that car. I didn't have like an SUV or four four wheel drive or anything like that. Plus, it's a rental. I don't want to I don't want to mess it up and bring it back and be responsible for a lot of money. <laughs> is this also uh, what was the vintage on this? This is 2015. 15, well. So the Grand Cruise, these three are all from 2015. Okay. So this one's definitely more reserved uh, or tight uh, on the nose. Um, just really just, just get a little bit of that line, a little bit of that chalkiness. Um, yeah, so we're coming back to the more typical, yeah. understated, uh, shabbly uh, uh, sophistication. There's a, there's a cleanness to it too, uh, almost like a concrete, um, like being on wet concrete type of thing. But then on the palate, it really shines. Um, you still get that very clean, um, very, very clean steely is, I think, really a good, not gun flint, but very steely um, uh, quality to it. Very sharp, uh, again, acidic. Um, uh, the lime is there and it's, it's very, the, the lime isn't as, as pronounced as maybe some of the other wines we've had, but it's a very super clean wine. Um, refreshing. I mean, this would be, this would be like a great, like you're 95 degrees on a hot, hot sunny day, refreshing type of thing. And then you can combine it with, you know, I mean, there's a, I get, I get hints of orange also um, as it's, as it's progressing in my mouth. And not just the first two, when I, I mean, all, all the wines so far, so what I had for lunch was I had basically a chicken skewer at that restaurant and they, they put um, uh, lemon and thyme. It was baked, uh, cooked with lemon and thyme. And I did have a Chablis and they didn't tell me which one it just is. A lot of these wine lists for like by the glass, you just say you're getting this, this or this, like a, 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 an area, but they don't really give you the producer. 
So I have no idea whose Premier Crew by the glass I had, but I had that, and it was a it was a great pairing. So I mean, I could see having this with something like that. I also made a friend in the in the uh, the the dog that that I guess lives there or something. I don't know. There's I guess the owner has a dog and this huge dog, and he just kind of walked out, walked outside, and sat next to me. <laughs> I gave him a couple pieces of chicken. I asked first, though. I said, was that okay? That was a great wine. He didn't ask for any Chablis to go with it? No, no, he didn't. Um, and as I spoke to him in English, I realized he probably didn't, well, not that dogs really, I mean, dogs understand a lot, but I actually looked up in French how to say I don't have any more and no more and how to say one more, which I don't remember now. But um, uh, I looked it up so I could tell the dog, one more, here you go, there's one more and I have no more for you in French, in the best way I could say it. So I have a little app on the phone that actually will speak the words for me if I need to. So this is the last of the three uh, okay. Chablis Grand Cru from 2015. Okay. We actually do produce more. We, uh, we produce in total six Grand Cru, but uh, Got it. these are the three that are, are currently still available. So which one's this? Uh, this is the Chablis Grand Cru Bougro. Cote de Bougro, which okay. is a plot selection within Bougro. Got it. Because I can see it's the same one on the back, but I'm like, there's got to be something different about this one. Yeah, so you'll notice a minor indication on go. the label. Right. So all of these wines are, are available. Uh, so in where, the States. where is this uh, in relation to the whole Bougro? This uh, is, comes from a plot, uh, from, uh, from plot selection at the foot of the hill. So where my car is. So if you, dro <laughs> you drove up the, yes. The, well, uh, the, next to the road, kind of. Yes, okay. to, the, to the, 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 the inlet, to the right. That little, yes. okay, so that little. So, so if you continued, you would have seen a, the very, the foot of the hill, which it has, which is much steeper. It sort of bends down. Yeah. Uh, and it's more southern facing. Uh, it's much more pebbly and the, the, the top soil is much shallower. So the, the, the growing conditions are much more one since severe strict demanding uh, for those vines uh, and so they do have other other characteristics or additional characteristics to, compared to the other blue grow and this feels like it's got a little bit more to it um a little more i hate to use the word body with shibli but there's definitely a little more complexity um to the to the palette it's, um, yeah, it's a more assertive wine, huh? Yeah. This is really good. I mean, every single wine, of course, is going to be good. But every single wine we've had here has been spectacular. Um, and then these three are available in the States. And then we talked about those two over there. Everything we've had is available in the States. Everything is available in the States. Okay. In, in fact, the only wine we don't, don't ship is the Petit Chablis. But otherwise, our <laughs> Chablis, okay. our Premier Cru, and our Grand Cru are available okay. in the United States. Um, which, uh, out of all the, how many of the Grand Crus do you do you use of, of the seven? Uh, we have uh, holdings in five out of the seven Grand Cru climates. Okay. But uh, since we make two uh, two wines with the you know with the different plot selections in Bougro, we have a total of six. Very nice. This is great. A great tasting, and uh, I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Um, I think we're going to wrap this up, I guess. Yeah. All right. Um, again, thank you very much. Thanks for uh, coming. Uh, Nicholas, for, for giving me some uh, great knowledge and information and, and the time uh, to hang out here. Uh, folks, that's going to do it for this episode. As always, click the links above to friend me up. Uh, then click the link below. Uh, I got a link for, for the winery. And I'm going to try to find uh, this video here um, up on YouTube so you all can check that out. And um, that's going to do it for this episode. Thank you very much for stopping by, and we'll see everyone again next time.